I'm Hugh Davies, the David C. Copley Director of the Museum of Contemporary Art, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here and to thank all of you who are members of the museum for making exhibitions and lectures like this possible, and to invite those of you who are here for the first time to join the museum and take advantage of these opportunities. I also want to thank the lead sponsors of this marvelous exhibition of Christo and John Claude, our trustee, Colette Carson Royston, and her husband, Dr. Ivor Royston. <laughs> Colette, can you give a little wave, just a little wave so we can see you? Thank you. Uh, today, uh, we honor a good and generous man, David Copley. Uh, David was a major supporter of this institution and many institutions in San Diego uh, throughout his life. He was a trustee of MCA for 18 years, and he was our president from 2011 until uh, the time of his death. Um, he was a passionate art collector. He drew great pleasure from his, his knowledge of art, from living with art, and above all, from his friendship with Christo and John Claude. He knew a lot of artists, but he had an ongoing, very engaged relationship with these two major artists over 35 years. The residue of that friendship is the extraordinary collection that he has left to this museum and to this city, the largest collection of Christo's work in private hands in the United States, and as I like to say, the largest collection west of the Potomac, because the National Gallery has a slightly larger collection. But we're going to change that, Christo. We're going to acquire more works and bump them. Um, Christo has had a long and important relationship with this museum. He had his first exhibition in 1971, which is 44 years ago. And during the intervening 44 years, he's had more exhibitions at this museum than any, other, than any other museum in the world. And it's something we're very proud of, and I think it shows our deep and abiding commitment to this extraordinarily important artist. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Christo for 40 years since I was a graduate student and volunteered on one of his projects. And I also want to thank him for his generosity in assembling this exhibition. Uh, he designed the installation. He sent out his first-rate crew to install the exhibition. He has donated, in David Copley's memory, a very important early package from 1961. And as he was preparing the lecture, he called me up and said, David never had a drawing of the Mastaba for Abu Dhabi. I'm going to speak about that. You must have a drawing. I'm sending one tomorrow. So we are incredibly grateful to you, Christo, for many things. And I won't, I won't give a long introduction because you literally need no introduction. I'll just say that for me, you're one of the greatest artists of our time. In fact, you're one of the greatest artists of any time. And I welcome you back to La Jolla. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before... Before we start the, the lecture, I always try to remember what Jean-Claude was saying because she was a bet, better <coughs> speaker than me. She articulates better and she talks slowly that the people can understand us. And I was requested to talk very slowly that they can understand everything. Now, always Jean-Claude was saying that miss, um, myself and Jean-Claude were born the same day, the same year, the same hour, uh, June 13, 1935, be aware, by, by two different mothers. <laughs> uh, we met Jean, I met Jean Claude in 1958 in Paris. We lived for six years in Paris between 1958 and 64. And in 64, we emigrated to the United States. Jean Claude, no, 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 we don't emigrate to the United States. We emigrated to New York City, Manhattan. And we're still living in the same building, downtown Manhattan, since 1964, 50 years. And of course, we were renting only two top floors, and now we own the building, and all the activities happen <laughs> in that building club. Uh, what I will do now, I will talk mostly about the two works in progress, the Over the River, the project for Arkansas River and Colorado, and the Mastaba project for Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. I will go down, and it will be all dark, 
We show this about 90 images quite fast to articulate that. And after that, I will answer many questions to ask me. But I will not answer questions about politics, <laughs> not about religion, and certainly not about other artists, only at ourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs> In 1991, we're just finishing the, project, the Umbrellas Joint Project for Japan and United States. It was the project who have 1,300 blue umbrellas in Japan and 1,760 yellow umbrellas in Southern California from in Los Angeles and Kent County. The length of the project in Japan was 12 miles long, and actually we have a 90 umbrellas standing in Sato River. There was no river in California, and the length of the project in California was 16 miles long, it's about two, half, two and a half miles wide. But basically, in the eastern part of Los Angeles County and the section of Kern County and around Interstate 5. When this umbrella was standing in California and Japan in early, middle of October 1991, and much before we have idea about the umbrellas. In 1971, we started to work in a project involving the wrapping of the former, and today, of course, the Parliament of Germany, the Reichstag. To get permission for that project was a very long, long process. And almost 20 years, we have three refusals for the permission. One was in 1977, one in 81, and 1987. And when the umbrellas were standing in California and Japan, we received a letter from the Speaker of the House, the President of the German Parliament, Professor Dr. Greta Sussman, congratulating us for the umbrella, but she was also saying, but now I'd like to help you to chart the permitting process for the Reichstag. But myself and Jean-Claude, we already have idea for the new project. And that is a very early sketch, actually 8 and a half by 11 inches, like a letter size paper, of the very first proposal how the over the river we look. We like to suspend horizontally fabric panel way above the water. And I glue that little person to see, to be experienced from above. It can go down to the river and to experience the project from underneath. But, but the chances to get permission was so, uh, uh, for the rice was so important. This is by between 1962, 63, and 64. We sp 92 and 93, we spent uh, 180 days in the capital of Germany, city of Bonn, that time, lobbying 660 deputies of the German parliament. Jean-Claude have up to here with the city of Bonn, who was quite a boring city, small city, and especially uh, with all these politicians, and she said, we like to do that project in the United States. Some way like a beautiful holidays. And this is why between 92 and 94, we travel, we travel in a, a prospecting 89 rivers in the Rocky Mountains in the United States. From this 89, we drive about 15,000 miles on this three summer, and from this 89 rivers, we come to six possible sites for over the river. There was the two rivers in the state of Idaho, section. Section of Pite River, a section of Salmon River. One section of Wind River in the state of Wyoming, Two possible rivers instead of Colorado, Cash La Poudre, north of Denver, south of Denver, Arkansas River, and the first section of Rio Grande. Our friend photographer, Wolfgang Voss, traveling with us, he always takes photographs. And this is typical little study, again, very small study. I'm standing here and using the real landscape of Arkansas River. I draw, use wax crayon and pencil and uh, Google the map. And this is how, this is very little study early from uh, 60, I think, 64. Four or 65. But finally, in February 1964, we get permission for the wrapping around the ice stack. We stopped to work off over the river. And finally, in the summer of 1965, the rice stack was wrapped. 1995, the rice stack was wrapped with one million square feet of silver color fabric. Uh, about 15,000 feet of rock, I think. I, Try to, you know, it's very difficult. I need to start convert it for, for meter to, to feet because they are using meters. And the project stayed for two weeks late June, early July of 1995. Here's view from above. Some of you know where the rice is situated. 
is the edge of Tear Garden, this is the Brandenburg Gate, and that is, we, on these two weeks, we have over five million people come to see the Reichstag. We remove all the fabric, we remove all the ropes and steel parts, there's so much steel involved in that project. Everything was recycled and we returned back to New York. Now, many years before the Reichstag was realized, in 1979, we have a project for New York City called The Gates. We start to negotiating the permission of the gates with the Koch administration, that time the mayor of New York City, but, but in 1981, the city of New York, the Koch administration, say no. In 1995, we tried to again working in the project uh, and to get the permission for the gates, but the, uh, Mr. Giuliani was not interested in the project, and in the same way, we have not yet site for over the river. This is why in the summer of 96, our team returned to the site of the six, the six possible river. Our chief engineer, Vince Davenport, is right here, tried to take a lot of measurement from the condition of these two, uh, these six possible river, recorded all this information, and decided aesthetically and engineering-wise who, what river is most suitable project. What is very important, you know, that this fabric panel that would be suspended, you saw little drawings before, they will be attached on steel cables. This is why these steel cables should be at least 96 inches from the water. That is regulation. And Vince designed that special pulley system that we can calculate it from the banks of the river, that we have all those, that clearance for the uh, rafting under the river. Sometimes can be higher, but not less than 96 inches. This is typical situation when we have a three yellow rope, simulated three steel cable, creating the space for two fabric panels. Basically, going through all this river in the, all these different states, we collected many, many information. And finally, by the late 96, early 97, we came to consensus that for aesthetical reason, engineering reason, and many other reasons, we'll tell you later, that Arkansas River in the state of Colorado will be most suitable for the project. This is the section of the state of Colorado. You have a Denver up there, the second largest city, Colorado Springs, and the project is basically two hours drive from Denver, from international port of Denver. Denver, you can fly to Denver from London and to Frankfurt directly. And the east entrance of the project is in the 5,800 feet, it's about 10 miles west from Canyon City. And this 42 miles of Arkansas River, we installed around six miles of fabric panels and eight different locations. And the West entrance of the project is in 7,200 feet. It's about two and a half hours drive from uh, east from Aspen, west entrance. Coming to the site of the project, I will show you how, how the river looks. Basically, it's the typical. We have the north bank of the river, Union Pacific Railroad tracks. The south bank of the river, we have the Highway 50. On many occasions, the banks of the river are not the same height. And I tell you, they, the Arkansas River have about 300,000 rafter in the summertime. Very gentle rafting. If you're familiar with category of rafting, it's category two, and only two occasions, category three, basically you can hire rafters like taxi to come you down, to take you down. And having the river, I start to do the preparatory study with the real sites. Here is the, the collage uh, of the preparatory study for the over the river. The left side is done with chalk, charcoal, pencil, pencil, graphite, and uh, was crayon. I use real cloth to simulate our fabric panels, not real, the, the real fabric of the panels, much finer fabric. Typical interruption when you have the vegetation and, and the rock formation, and when you have an interruption, we have this diagonal steel cable securing the fabric panels. When you go underneath, you have absolutely different vision of the project. Now, the fabric panels, the width of the fabric panels varied with the width of the water of the river, meaning that when the fabric panels, the width changed. Sometimes they're only 45 feet wide, sometimes they're 120 feet wide. From cable to cable, the fabric panels is 35 feet. And of course, the cable go much further away, anchor, anchor on the banks of the river, and like you see in some of the picture before, the banks of the river, they're they not always the same height. Sometimes the fabric panel is inclined in a different way. Now, the most difficult part of all our projects is to get permission. And the most important thing is to get the permission is to 
to find who is responsible or own the space of the land for our project. Very fast, we understand that almost 95% of the entire span of Arkansas River for the project is regulated by the United States Federal Government, Department of Interior, Special Undersecretary of Interior, it's called Bureau of Land Management. But this is all happening in the 90s now. And before we go to Washington, now it was very important to present the project to the community living there in these 42 miles. And we try to explain what we like to do and to, before we start to working with the federal government. Here in the town of Salida, who is in the west entrance of the project, uh, you see myself, Jean Cote, our chief engineer of Vince Davenport, and the wall we have, a photograph of a realized project. Is the town uh, and uh, mostly wall with the uh, senior citizen hippies who arrived here in the late 60s and they settled on that, time, that town. And this is the, the uh, uh, senior center in Salida. And I, uh, we try to explain who we are. For example, we tell them that a night, because they know very little about us, but in 1969, outside of Sydney, Australia, we are up coastline. This is one and a half miles long coastline with the 85 feet high cliffs to the sandy beach area using one and a half million square feet of this special uh, polypropylene fabric and about 30 miles of ropes in the September, October of 1969. In uh, August of 1972, we did Valley Curtain, the project in Colorado, huge uh, uh, orange curtain actually is the span of the main span of Brooklyn Bridge in the center is 180 feet high and 360 feet on the main foundation. And between 1972 and 76, we work, in, we work in Northern California and finally in September of 1976, running fence was installed. This is an 18 feet tall fence running at, for 24 and a half miles to Sonoma and Marin County. And western extremity of the fence disappearing and Pacific Ocean for the quarter of a mile. You have a little person here to see with the scale of the height of the fence. In 1978, uh, we did that very intimate, beautiful project in Loose Park in Kansas City, Missouri, where we covered with this golden fabric, the about two and a half miles walkway in Loose Park in the middle of the town of Kansas City, Missouri. And in 1980, between 1980 and 83, we worked hard, and finally we get permission to install the surrounded island. This project is Jean Claude idea to surround 11 islands and Biscayne Bay and Dade County in Florida, actually between Northern Island here in the Dalton position, the Southern Island is about seven miles, and we use that. This is the biggest amount of fabric we use a project. We use six and a half million square feet of fabric, especially. Uh, designed to floating on the surface of the, fo the water. The fabric was attached in the beach area, floating 220 feet on the surface of the water, ending with that octagonal shape, uh, shape of boom, and of course anchoring with 1,000 marine an anchor in the shallow Biscayne Bay. And finally, after uh, 10 years of negotiation, two refusal, in 1985, the pond of the up. This is the oldest bridge in Paris, over 450 years old bridge in Paris, wrapped with this champagne color fabric on beautiful summer, day, summer, late afternoon, autumn day of September and early October of 1985. And many years after, many years before, after the idea to wrap Livery Street during the winter time, finally in 1998, we wrap 178 trees and Berove Park in Fundacion Baila. We have this in late autumn. We have a, a sunny days. We have a winter. This is the real color pictures. You have people walking and beautiful sunset. And from there, we're going now to the, the Salida was the west entrance of Project City, going to Canyon City, the east entrance, east entrance of the Project City. It's typical, again, town hall meeting. You see, our team is sitting on the left side, our chief engineer, myself, Jean-Claude. On the left side, you have all this federal government agency, which tight and official, the high department, etc. This is all happened in the late 90s. Finally, and I think in 90, 
1998, we arrived in Washington presenting a project to the director of, of Bureau of Land Management, Mr. Tim Fry. This all happened during the Clinton administration. The very important part was that we need to put together all these agencies that work together because there will be very long and complicated process that we jump from one and one, one agency to another agency. I will show a typical meeting of our uh, moment during this time. You know, our team is on the left side. You see, uh, our chief engineer, Vincent Jean Claude, myself, and all the officials on the right side, the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, the Highway Department, the, uh, the Colorado um, uh, just, um, high, um, uh, parks, and variety of different subjects, that all the questions about the project should be discussed simultaneously, not jumping one after one. It was very important also to, pr produce, to advance the project technically that we do a lot of other study. The very important part is that the, the, to fill all this data, our chief engineer, Vince Davenport, tried to hire the company in Toronto, Canada, RWDI, who is outside Toronto in the Guelph to conduct wind tunnel test. We're behind the glass, and you have this three fabric panel, one sixteen scale, and of course the fabric panel, they attach to anchors, to hooks, and we try to learn many faults of the wind in the older uh, situation, how it's happened. Now, but all our project, the unique image, you know, we never do the same, th same things again. We all, we cannot, this, I, myself or Jean-Claude, we cannot find how the project should be built with what material in the studio of Manhattan. This is why for all our projects, we do life sites tests. Basically, a secret place, somewhere far away from the site of the project, we can fabricate it on one-to-one scale, small section of the project, and, visualize, and uh, make comparison of material, of thickness of fabric, anchoring, a variety of things. In the late 90s, we did four life site tests in the private ranch uh, on the western part of the Rocky Mountains uh, in Colorado near the Utah border, and this is how it's happened. You see, our compound is here, our engineers, they're here. This is the fabric panel on the one to one scale. Each of these fabric has different thickness of fabric, different folds, different grommets. For example, here you have the first fabric panels have a copper and aluminum. Basically, the silver color, like we have the fabric panel, is not a silver color, it's actual real metal aluminum pulverized a very special method to the fabric, fiber, to the fabric thread, and they reflect very richly. The first half, a little bit copper, the second is only silver, and when from above, the fabric panel will move like exactly like that in the wind, but when going underneath, it's the same fabric panel from underneath. This loosely heavy woven fabric is like a carpet, and through the fabric, I can see the cloud formation and contour of the mountains, actually, you can see even here, Jean-Claude standing and that things. Now, one very important thing with David Copley is that he was not a simple collector. David was always very eager to follow all the process of the making of the project. I will never forget it that when he was doing that life site test, you see in the left side side, David and his great team, our project, our director of the museum, Hugh is there on the left side of the picture, and the trustee, they flow to Grand Junction. And Vladimir and another friend go to Grand Junction, drive them to the site of the project, and here's the picture in the late 90s, David standing with me, Jean-Claude, and Hugh Davis, and the trustee. The same things happened with the gates. In 19, 2002, the gates, uh, we need to move the life site test to the gates, and the property of Vince Davenport and Junita Davenport, our chief engineer and project director of the project, their summer house, and the east from Seattle and the Cascade Mountains, Vince built the real walkway and asphalt, like in Central Park, you see them down there, with different type of anchors, uh, base for the gates, and different types of folds of the fabric. And this is typical of a uh, situation where we did that in the autumn of 19, 2002. And actually, the irony that when Vince built this walkway, and we need to see how these gates be will behave in different time of the season. This is why they stay for almost a year. And we can see them, how they look in the snow, how they look in the rain, and the sun, and how they move with the wind. And nobody, 
or from Seattle area, with the state of Washington, make connection. That was the gates for Central Park. Uh, now, I was telling you that we're using around six miles of fabric panels and eight different locations. And this early 2001, we, 2000, we need to pinpoint exactly where the fabric panels will go. This is very close up of the site of the project. We have a plane flowing over Arkansas River, producing huge map. Each 50 feet is one inch. Using this map, myself and Jean Claude and Vince Davenport, and we walk to the site and position all these uh, uh, places when the fabric panel should be installed. You see the re fabric panel, they're always rectangular. The red line is the, the, the um, uh, cables go much further away. When the river turns, we need to fabricate these trapezoid panels. Typical situation of interruption because the river became wider, narrow, and of course the bridge here. All that was pinpoint exactly all, through all these uh, 42 miles. All that costs a lot of money. Myself and Jean-Claude were not independently wealthy. The money came only from the sale of our original works of art I do and my studio alone. Now, I was showing my studio for over near 50 years, actually 50 years, I have no time to clean my studio. <laughs> this is the section of my studio, one end of the studio, and that little table, I usually do the small uh, sites work, like little study, little side study, a little collages, and I glue uh, fabric, uh, um, technical documents, and variety of things. Uh, and when that uh, collage is done, it's looking like that. This is a preparatory study for the Pondoff project. You know, they had all done before. I do not make preparatory study when the project is realized. They had all before. And of course, and this is work in two parts, you know. The lower part is done with pencil, charcoal, wax crayon. I use cloth to simulate the fabric of the Pondoff, but much finer cloth, twine to simulate the ropes. Uh, and the upper part usually is the uh, main information. You have the typical aerial photography of Paris, the island of the city, Notre Dame up there, the, the oldest bridge here on the tip of the island of the city. This is drawings of, of the Marchand de Cerceau who designed uh, the pond of, for uh, King Henry III. The frontal view on the uh, smaller arms of the bridge, cross section of the bridge. And that particular collage is in the collection. <coughs> in Belgium. This is the same site study <coughs> for the Gates project. Of course, you can recognize, recognize that study is just, the, is done just before <coughs> the Gates is realized. It's 2003, I think so. <coughs> and the lower part is done with pencil, charcoal, wax crayon. <coughs> This is finer cloth I use for the fabric panels of the gates. I put the folds, and the upper part, the upper section, have a real sample of the real fabric, and this is a section of Central Park. Now, when we have a succession of gates who they are 12 feet apart, <coughs> you have this solid orange line. But when you have a tree, branches of the tree, very low, if you can only position one or two gates, you have this remark, etc. Now, that particular collage is in a collection in uh, Stockholm. Uh, here is a very small um, study uh, about over the river, actually the photograph, little photography, life science study, who over this photographic study done with a wax crayon and enamel pen, I put these uh, lines, you know, grit, and that helped me to transfer that study to a large piece of paper. This is another not very glamorous place in my studio. This is still my studio. The wall is still like that. Uh, I'm still that time young. You know, my hair is darker during the wrapping of the Reichstag. There's a little sketch in the left side of the Reichstag, and that is the medium-sized drawing, one met, uh, 165 inches drawing and two parts, 42 by 165, but 42 by 65, for pastel, charcoal, wax crayon, uh, upper part, you have a cross, cross section of Reichstag building with the photograph of tech from the Brandenburg Gates during the Cold War, actually, before the war fell down, so 1977. And that is a private collection in Berlin. 
this is another large preparatory study for the blue umbrellas in a 96 inches drawing. The left side is the entire valley of Ibaraki with 1,340 blue dots. The location of... It's not working? No, just it's scratch. It's kind of the location of all this umbrella. And actually, on the top of that map is a small village of Jimba. When in that village, we have about 30 houses. We installed over 100 umbrellas in Vending and that village. Uh, and, and this is the larger size drawings. Now, we sell these original works. From the upper floor, which is my studio, we bring this original work to our second floor, who our living room, and it's a place when people come to buy. Now, who is the people who come to buy? They're collectors, dealers, private dealers, corporation. They come, they choose the work, they give us money, and they take the work. I hope you understand how we have money. There are no other illusion. Sometimes the collectors like to, or museum like to have early works. Here I will show you the, this is a package of 1961 who belonged to a National Gallery of Washington. And this one of these collectors, one good day, was the David. And David saw the rough portrait of Jean-Claude. It was a little postcard. And David said, he was exhibited in London, the museum in London. And David said, I'd like to have that. And David bought that portrait. But a few months later, David said, I'd like to have my portrait wrap. And this is why we wrapped also David's portrait. You can see it here in the museum in 2000. And what is, I forget what year, 2006, after the gates was realized. Now, I did, we sell all kinds of works. We sell the early works from the late 50s, early 60s, but we sell also works who I did it just when I arrived in New York. For example, in 1964, even before, I started to work in the proposal to do the storefronts. Actually, from the street, I recuperate uh, uh, from demolition of storefronts. I can recuperate part of the storefronts, rebuild this sculpture, uh, the real storefront, the middle of the room. And that is the first storefront I did in the Chelsea Hotel room in New York in 1964. Uh, it was exhibited Leo Castelli, now is in the museum, in uh, Hirschen Museum, Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. And, and when I live in Paris, in a studio in Paris, I have Paris, the outside of Paris, I did a number of works involving barrels. This is the barrels, like industrial barrels I find, and some of the barrels was wrapped. This is all pieces from 19, late 58, 59, or barrel sculpture. The simple barrels I used to, to do uh, in the museum, now with a private collection in, in Netherlands, is now belong to the Kroller Müller Museum in Holland. It's one of the greatest museums of modern art, I have the biggest collection of early works of ours. This is 56 barrel sculpture of the 60. And finally, with the barrels also, I will show you the, the, our second collaboration, Jean-Claude and myself, that in 1962, we did this work of art called the Iron Curtain, wall of 100 barrels in the small street in Paris, Rue Visconti, in the left bank. Now, a year ago, in 1961, on August, Berlin Wall was built. I was, I was that time, I was a political refugee, and of course, all that was extremely important for me. And this is our po poetical response for the Berlin Wall. We, I did a number of sculptures with barrels. I will show another. This is sculpture of barrels in museum in Milan when we stack barrels horizontally. And of course, we stack barrels horizontally because they're cylindrical object. The, Angles is always 60 degrees. And night, late 1960, 68, 69, we proposed to build a large master bar, not bigger like an Abu Dhabi, in uh, uh, Texas between Houston and Galveston. We will never arrive to get permission. In the early 70s, we proposed to build a small size master bar, a parking lot. In the Coral Mirror Museum, one is a big collector of our works, but we never get permission. And finally, in 1977, we start to work on the Abu Dhabi project and propose to build a master bar of 410,000 oil barrels. Now, this is a large structure built, built by 410,000 barrels. In 1979, we did a scale model. That is the scale model of 1979. Each vertical wall have 110,000 barrels. 
and is the proportion of that sculpture is the 500 feet tall, 1,000 feet in the ground here, is 750 feet and the slot, slanted wall. The vertical wall is done by the 110,000 uh, barrels with 10 different colors. Variety of colors. This, each vertical wall is painted by itself, different colors. We can elaborate later. The slanted wall is built, uh, the barrels have the rings, the slanted wall have orange and yellow colors. <coughs> Using that scale model, <coughs> we did that scale model, uh, Using that scale model, that are photo montage. You see the little, little car here and the model here. Finally, in 1979, we arrived in Abu Dhabi and Jean-Claude, very young, myself very young, presenting the project to the Minister of the Culture of Abu, United Arab, of Sheikhdom of Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, and the, up there is the founder of United Arab Emirates, the, it's like George Washington, United Arab Emirates, <laughs> Sheikh Zayed al Nahyan, <coughs> who put together all these seven Sheikhdom. And through all these late 70s, early 80s, we make several, many trips, working a lot of community there, working with a representative, making, making lecture presentation, here Jean-Claude collecting the sand for the scale models, here presenting the project to the people who probably can help us to uh, fabricate the barrels, here presenting to the University of Abu Dhabi the project with those countless lectures there, and here in the library of the, the library of Abu Dhabi, presenting the project to the Western people and Abu Dhabi people, and here, one of the last photographs of myself with Jean-Claude in Abu Dhabi in 1982-83. <coughs> and 19... <coughs> and this is another photograph. Actually, this photograph was one of the last because some of these people here, Abu Dhabi people, they're still alive and they remember. They're so excited to find us again. In 1999, a museum of Germany, inside that museum, this is inside that museum, with a wall of 13,000 oil barrels. <coughs> you see here, standing here, is 60 meter wide, it's about 180 feet wide, a long wall, about 75 feet high, is about 21 feet depth. This is a huge column, like a, a, a column made on steel, and you have an inside elevator, you can take the elevator to see all that structure from above. In 2001, we, uh, we finally, we get, uh, 2002, we get the permission for the Gates project, and uh, Gates was installed in 2005, 7,503 gates, over 23 miles of walkway. We have a, 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 a width of the gates to six feet wide, to 18, to 18 feet wide, and this beautiful 16 days, in late February 19, uh, 2005, we have the, all the days Jean-Claude was dreaming. To have a sunny day, we have a snow in the tree, winter, and this is the view of the section of the gates and Central Park South and, of course, uh, downtown Man um, Manhattan. After 16 days of exhibition of the gates, all the materials removed, industrially recycled, and we return back in the project. Now, in 2007, this is the last time Jean-Claude uh, uh, was, was with us in Abu Dhabi. She's walking here with Vol uh, Vladimir. And we try to locate at the site of the project. The project we like very much to be built in inland is about 130 miles south of Abu Dhabi. And Abu Dhabi is there. And the, one of the most beautiful deserts called the Empty Quarter, an oasis of Liva near Saudi Arabian border. But more, very important part is that to move that project ahead, in the early years, when it was in the late 1780, we have our American engineers, a little bit engineering the project, but Jean-Claude was very eager to have a input to many different ways of building that project. And our organization, who is a real corporation, non-profit, non real corporation, we hired the services of the four of the most distinguished engineering school universities around the world. We had the services of the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, the professor, the assistant, the services of professor of United Kingdom, University of Cambridge, professor and the assistant, University of Champagne, Illinois, and professor and the assistant, Jose University in Tokyo. You see, have a professor Sazaki, the gentleman with the glasses. And professor Sazaki uh, 
proposed one of the most ex extraordinary processes to build that project. This professor and the assistant, we do not know each other that we hired, hired them. They work independently. They, uh, they produce a, a, a very in-depth proposal, concept, how much we cost, how should we build, etc. And one of the greatest uh, resources of that is Professor Zaki, which comes something that nobody must build up before. What Professor Zaki said, the biggest issue of that project to install 410,000 things in a very precise place. If you build a structure, install that one by one, it will be very, very slow, very, very uh, annoying, and too complicated. And what he proposed, to flattening the project. Voila. So you see the master bar, the geometric form with the five elements. the two rectangular, two trapezoid, and three rectangular sides. And that is totally horizontal. Of course, it's not horizontal. It's a huge superstructure, 70 feet high, like a bridge truss, sitting on 100 railroad tracks. And you, the workers, we install the barrels like a mosaic on the floor. In the middle of that, on the roof of the master bar, he built this 500 feet hydraulical tower, like air control tower and airports. And the wall, all that is ready. When this 410,000 barrels install, install, that entire structure, Professor Suzaki would be, would be elevated in less than the side, seven days. And of course, to tell you how big is that project, I will show you here. That is the vertical, this is the pyramid of Giza. <laughs> Without knowing, the proportion of the master bar is two, three, four. One element I will use in meter is 75 meter. Two is 150 meter. Three is 225. Four is 300 meter. When is the footprint of master bar is that, the square of Bernini and Vatican. And to give you the scope of the master with the golden gate. And now, meanwhile, we are working also because we're working also in the positioning the master bar on the side. We have a little scale model here. It was very important to situate the, situate the vertical wall with sunrise and sunset because on some occasion the vertical wall we became golden and sunset. And here, where Vladimir with a compass position how the vertical wall should be situated. And this is our picture with the little scale models. Now, this is the, the footprint of master bar in the site of the project. You see the little cars there? And that is the, was very important to find how the master bar would be high. We have a friend in Mirati who have this special helium balloon with a little calculate measurement instrument. And the same landscape is here. And you have the cars. You know where is the master bar? Now, this is another typical thing. You know, I le we lecture to the young women. They're all well, you know, you cannot see them. You can see them, you cannot photograph them, but they are, they are not covering their faces. Here, we're presenting the project to the, the ruler representative, the um, Sheikh Hamdan, who is the brother of the ruler of the United Arab Emirates, and, and his father, the founding father, and his other brother. And now we are applying to the, meanwhile, all that is happening simultaneously. We are applying to the federal government. This is in the middle of uh, late uh, 2000, in the middle of 2000, after the gates. We are applying for the permission to the federal government of Washington. We cannot apply for the over the river writing a letter to the federal government of Washington. We ha you need to hire a special company to prepare your application. It's called Planning and Design Report for Over the River. That application is prepared by the specialized company. They exist all through the United States. That company worked for one and a half years, produced 2,029 page application for the permission of the river. Cost us one and a half million dollars. That is application to Washington for over the river. When the Washington federal government received that thing, Bureau of Land Management, they saying, but this is people who work for you. You pay them. Now we hire another company, the same type of company, 
they will work for us. Only you pay them via us. You cannot talk to them, cannot invite them for dinner. And the federal government uh, hire a company, work for near two years, over two years. And after town hall meetings and many uh, uh, discussion, the federal government prepared an environmental impact statement who was 1,686 pages, cost us two and a half million dollars. Having this study, the federal government made the decision to, uh, to give permission, not permission. And decision is called record of this year, wrote. And I remember when we were expecting that decision to be announced, uh, the Secretary of Interior, Interior uh, Mr. Ken Salazar, was the friend that we met before when he was Senator of Colorado and Washington. And we asked him that to not make the announcement in the Department of Interior. And we take, talk to the Rusty Powell, Director of National Gallery, because he's the biggest collector, to allow us that all the announcement will happen in the National Gallery of Washington. And here, uh, before that, we also talked to the <laughs> governor uh, of Colorado, Hickenlooper, who was through all his uh, time, when he was mayor of Denver, and the governor of Colorado was a big supporter of the project. And finally here, uh, Ken Salazar in the National Gallery of Washington announcing the decision that we have a go ahead put over the river. And to finish that, I will show you some preparatory study, typical to see how the fabric panel can be very inclined, like that when the bank is different. Another view from internet, this is a quite recent study. This is another study for the Mastaba, another study for Mastaba. Thank you very much. I was just wondering if there's any sort of rhyme or reason or pattern to the coloring of the barrels and the arrangement, or if it's mostly random. Absolutely random. <laughs> I can answer. tell you how is random and how much was expensive. Because when we build the mastaba, we use this little wooden, how's it called? Wooden towels? Towels. And like impressionist painting, I painted all this wall totally, totally pointily with no any pattern no anything. Now, when the project advanced for engineering recently now, we need to hire architectural students to put on a computer the, how the colors vary and vertical wall. They take them from one wall, they take them take three months to put the, how they change the color from red to orange, blue, yellow, black, ta -ta, how they repeat it. I know very well that the low wall and the vertical uh, wall, the number of the barrels and the first row of the vertical wall is 1,523. And they start to put it, how many red, yellow, ta -ta. the next, wall, uh, next row is not at all related to that. It's all whimsical. I'd like to know how you maintain your perseverance after it takes so many years to get permission to do a project. In 50 years, we realized 22 projects, and we failed to get permission for 37 projects. <laughs> and some projects we have a refusal, like that uh, Rice Tech project, three times, but we still have to do it. Some projects, like the Gates, once, the uh, Ponev, twice. Uh, and, but we failed 37 projects. But one of these 37 projects, they are a lovely story. In 1975, uh, we wrapped public monuments, and the one is exhibited here in the museum here of Vittorio Emanuele, also the, the sculpture, the monuments of Vittorio Emanuele came from Italy and Piazza Domo and Milano, and the monument for Leonardo da Vinci, Piazza Scala and Milano. These are the only two public monuments we, we wrapped. And in 1970, in 1975, we were very eager, we spent a lot of time in Barcelona, we know very much Spain, Barcelona, and we were very eager to wrap the tallest monument of Christopher Columbus in Barcelona when he left from Barcelona to discover in America. And we started negotiating with the mayor of Barcelona 1975 to give us the permission. After two years, the mayor of Barcelona said no. And one year later, he was assassinated. <laughs> uh, uh, after that, in early 80, there was another mayor of Barcelona. We also asked him permission. He also say no, and one year later, he almost survived after attempt of coup d'etat to put him down. 
And uh, 1984, we already started working, fabricating material for the Pont Neuf. We received a letter from Pascual de Maragai, the mayor of Barcelona, who brought Olympic Games in Barcelona. He told Christo Jean-Claude, please come to Barcelona. I give you permission to wrap Christoval Colon. We say, we don't like to do it anymore. <laughs> but you know, if we spend our money, it's our desire, and if we don't like to do it anymore, why should we do it? This is the only project where this very strange story. Other question? <laughs> what inspired me in the beginning, you know, where all these public works, they're done in two different contexts. They're urban project or rural project. They're a project existing in the city, a project existing in the countryside, but always when the humans live, where the roads, telephone pole, road, all kind of activity. One important part we do this project, we need to have a, a man-made structure to have, the, to have the scale of the project. We cannot do a project on wilderness that cannot compare. This is why it was so important to have Arkansas River, because Arkansas River was Livet River. Livet meaning uh, there was a highway, there was the railroad track in the Union Pacific, there was a bridge, there were the telephone, houses, villages, towns, all this. And you can see the scale of the project. And it's, it's, this is how all these rural projects in the countryside, they are imme Im intimately related to the scale of humans. Of course, the city is totally different. And of course, sometimes we have the site, like the Gates project was designed for Central Park, and the Reistek project was designed for Reistek, but we, sometimes we have the idea, like for over the river or running fence, the umbrellas, and we need to find the site. And this is the the two way. Now, but inspiration for each project is totally different. They are not secret, I can tell you, but I can probably tell, I would tell you the inspiration for Over the River, but it's not the same for other projects because this is the, they are all accidental, they are not unpredictable, there are no rules. Now, the Over the River project comes from something that was like that in our image, our memory, but we were never thinking to do Over the River. In 1985, we're wrapping the Pont Neuf, and we use this champagne color fabric, and there, to wrap the Pont Neuf, we have an incredible uh, factory of sewing who fabricated all these panels, because each arch, each tower was different. It all tried to be costume made, and not we wrap the bridge, but we wrap also the, side, uh, the trottoir, the sidewalk of the bridge, but also we wrap the vault of the bridge. Now, the, the Pont Neuf have 12 arches, and they're all not identical. They're all different, different variation of arch, etc. And we need to fabricate fabric panels that <coughs> can be applied to the stone wall of the bridge. And our engineers decided that operation would happen with rock climbers who would position the fabric panel on the raft. That raft will be push, put, pushed by a tugboat, will be positioned under the pond nerve. And I remember Jean-Claude and myself we were uh, standing and there are watching the fabric elevated by the pulley system by rock climbers up to the wall to the bridge. And one moment the fabric was floating, suspended over the river, moving in all directions. And I remember the sun passing to the fabric, go to the river saying, and I remember that image in 1985, only 19, 1992 uh, that over the river came. That is the origin, the genesis of the river. The gates is a different story. The umbrella is a different story. They are a long, long story, but they are not secret. They are all absolutely different. My deepest condolences on the loss of Jean-Claude, and I know that she was your partner in life as well as your business partner. And though she can never be replaced, she did a tremendous amount of work with you and was um, a real business force. Who now is doing the uh, work that Jean Claude used to do alongside of you? It's very difficult. She will be missed all the time. You know, there is no way to be replaced. Uh, fortunately, Jean Claude was very uh, organized, and she hired two young men. One is the Jean Claude nephew, Jonathan Henry, who's sitting there. Another is Vladimir Yavashev, my nephew, and they worked for 20 years for Jean Claude. When she passed away. I inherit these two young men. <laughs> and, and 
and they do the work. I don't know anything what's happening in the office. <laughs> no way. Uh, and, and of course, uh, they have different activity in the organization. And they're actually in the, in the place we are living in house it's in Manhattan. Only three of us working. They know they're quite large building, uh, six floor, uh, I don't know, but 6,000 square feet. Only three people working there. But after that, after you should know that all this project, all the time, they have their own project director, chief engineer. For example, Junita Davenport, the project director of Over the River. He was also the project director of the Gates. And Vince Davenport, her husband, the chief engineer, director of construction for Over the River and the Gates. They, they, they are running the Over the River project. And the Over the River project have lawyers, engineers, an army of people who they work for the making of the river project. There are a variety of people who then work for us. They have their own company, but they are hired by the Over the River Corporation to deliver the services. All these big books and all these huge, countless meetings, they are not done by me or Junita and Vince. They are done by the team of people. Not easy. Sometimes we hire wrong people. We need to fire them. We need to find the right people. All these the long, long process of things. The same thing with the Mastava project. Mastava project have people working in Abu Dhabi and Berlin and Stockholm and United Kingdom, London and New York and Washington DC. And they're all working and they're, they're different. Of course, we need to have all the time the input of these things. But that was all the time when Jean-Claude was also there. They're, they're uh, unavoidable, for, but not only this. Also the, the project before, the running fence around the talent, all that is done in that way. I understand you've been to San Diego a number of times, and I was wondering, is there any site or uh, structure in San Diego that might inspire you? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I can tell you, <laughs> I can tell you that uh, initially, even that I live from in Manhattan, the East Coast, for 50 years. I know so well California, because the California is only one state yet that we did two projects, running fans and the umbrellas. And to do this project, I know California like my hand, <laughs> every little corner. And, and of course, I can tell you that when we're looking for sites for the umbrellas, there was the sites around here also. You know, this is that, it was not, with, you know, the umbrellas was project on two parts, briefly to tell you, and we decided to do it in the United States, Pacific Rim, because the West Coast is tilted to, to the uh, West, to the uh, Japan. And this is why it was definitely decided to do the American side of the umbrellas in California, not the northern part of the United States, like the uh, state of Washington, because the landscape of California is much more dramatically different from the wet landscape in Japan full of water. And this is why we were always rooming here around Los Angeles and San Diego area to find site for the umbrellas. And there was a thinking to be site very near to San Diego, but finally we find that area and, and Los Angeles uh, um, uh, County uh, near Tejon Pass and Kerr County were most suitable for the project. But you know, it's possible one day we can do something on that area. <laughs> hmm? I forgot. No, once, once the project of the umbrella start, we, we have a factory here. Actually, North Celt company who fabricated all the fabrication of the fabric for the umbrellas, and especially like a fabulously designed and sewn, was fabricated in San Diego. It was sewn in San Diego. Yeah, it's here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> North Celt. <laughs> yeah. So, Christo, what I want to know is, is there anybody in your organization that has the power to say, we can't possibly afford that idea, you're completely out of your mind? <laughs> Sometime, uh, John to say to somebody, you don't know, your father is totally out of his mind, but, but is it true? I'm out of my mind. Other question? He, here, somebody here? Ah, okay. Right here. 
You know, I, I hear much better if it comes down. There's some strange echo. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to take you back to your childhood when you were a child doing lots of different things. Was there a defining moment or inspiration where you said to yourself, this is what I want to do, I want to create it? At what moment did you know what you wanted when to I do? When I was a little child. You know, there is no difference from any other things. I was blessed to have great parents, uh, my mother and my father, so that I was loved to draw. And my father decided that I should have a private lesson, an art. I was six, seven years old. After school, I have a private tutor. I go to real painter with real oil painting. I go to real sculpture with wire to do a sculpture. And I go to the real architect to make scale models. And since, since age of six or seven, I try to be an artist now. About your inspiration, to but, something so grandiose, uh, uh, no, how does no, it come the, to you? No, they're not, no, they're not big. They're only big because they're works of art. Jean-Claude always saying the Ponov is not a very big, because Ponov anyway, anyway is not a very big bridge. <laughs> but only because it's work of art. It's totally useless and absurd is big. Not the, the humans built, built, built much bigger thing. Highway, bridges, airports, horrendously big. They're only big because they're totally useless and totally irrational. <laughs> Uh, 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 that is, in a sense, because the art is basically that. Art is, is not, art cannot be used. There is no use in art. They have, they term something that we can do, only humans can do. Nobody can do art, that the humans. And of course, they are not related to any rational thinking, reason to be, and this is why they have this quality. But no, but of course, you can find this, this project, they have many, many elements, but basically they deal with the, with the aesthetics and the color, proportion, dimension, space. And of course they deal, but of course they, they work in a very unusual way. You know, first, very important thing, I try to explain it. Uh, there's not something here. Okay. Painting is the flat, that's, that's the wall here. Uh, flat surface, it can be abstract or realist, depending. But the sculpture is like that uh, bottles here, three-dimensional work of art, is like bottle here. And, and uh, the sculpture sculpt the space and you walk, move around because change the space. Sometimes the sculpture can be very big, like uh, Alexander Calder, you can walk inside. All that space is designed by artists. Artists design how this form, how they will command you how to move there. Even today with uh, new, modern, uh, um, today contemporary artists, when you install variety of elements of television, etc. But all these elements, they're organized by the artists and that space, that artists try to create this perception that moving in that space. A space of museum and gallery and public spaces. Now, there one space we think very little about is that the moment you walk from your home, you start to walk on the street, somebody decide the sidewalk. You cross the uh, street, somebody decide the green and red light. Basically, 24 hours around the clock, we are funnel, funneled to highly reglamented space designed by urbanists, with a lot of restrictions, with all kinds of things. We even do not think about that. Even coming here, everything was designed in advance to see. And Jean-Claude was always saying, what we like to do, we like to borrow that space and create gentle disturbance for a few days. <laughs> <laughs> now, what we borrow in that space, we inherit. Everything were inherent to that space to become part of the work of art. We do not invent the politics in the Reichstag. It was in the Reichstag. We don't invent ecology in Biscayne Bay. What's in the re uh, Biscayne Bay? What's it telling the, the real Biscayne Bay? Now, in the sun, there's a big difference. For 14 days in 1995, we wrapped the Reichstag. You can see to here an exhibition. Photograph is about the wrapping of a Reichstag. You can see the drawings. The drawings about the wrapping of the Reichstag. 
but unfortunately eggs was the rice crop. Oh, the real biscuit bag. Basically, that reality cannot be substituted. The real one, two, three miles. The magnitude of the space cannot be substituted. This is why this project deal with space never be used in the art experience and to become something that is unique, irreplaceable. And this is some way that the work carry this moment when Bo take all these elements and for these precious 14 days you leave that space. For example, the gates. One gate was not a work of art. Two gates was not a work of art. 7,503 gates <laughs> and 23 miles of walk at Central Park with the leafless branches of the tree in a walkway designed at Olmsted in Walks in the skyline of Manhattan. With all that, togetherness is the work of art. Not one gate. It's not transportable. All that is the work of art. Yesterday when you were explaining to us when you first moved to France, one of the ways... One of, um, okay. one of the ways you said you would earn a living um, was by making painted portraits of people. Uh -huh. Why am I making portraits of people? Okay, but. And now today the majority of your two-dimensional artwork are um, either blueprints or preparation drawings. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could explain your transition to the art of blueprint making. And of the blue? Of, of blueprint making, the arts of blueprint making or preparation drawing making. And if there are any artists who have um, influenced any of your aesthetic choices when making these um, preparation drawings. Well, the, okay, now we're talking about the preparatory story for the project. You know, preparatory drawings for the project is simply drawings very much like architects, you know. They are very simple drawings. They sometimes is very elaborated. It's sometimes scale model. Uh, we don't have here a scale model. Actually, the Reichstag have a four scale model and different scale of these 25 years. They are very similar in the technique that architects or artists use to simulate how the work of art will exist. And I incorporate a variety of information through the development of the project. You see very well that the first drawings of Over the River, for example, taking example of Over the River, they are very schematic, they are very simple, because I have no idea what Over the River exists. We need to do a lot of research, work with our chief engineer, we need to do so much information, more and more the vision of Over the River, how it will be, it starts developing by the information, by the life size test, by the variety of things with the landscape, all that come and the drawings become more closer to the, what the project will look. All the story of our preparatory drawing is always like that. And they're classical, like working with paper, was crayon. I do not work with computers. And I can tell you that one important thing, I do not know how to drive. I don't have a driver's license. I don't like to talk on telephone. <laughs> and of course, I do not have the slightest idea to open a computer. I can understand anything. Probably because I like to have the real things. I cannot experience a uh, flat image. And this is why much of this drawing and study, they develop to the knowing more the sites, the sky, the variety of activity, and they incorporate, incorporated that knowledge of all the preparatory study. And this is why all this drawing is called preparatory, but they, they translate the evolution, the visual evolution of the project through all the years we take to in, to, until it's realized. And all our projects arrive, go through that stages. I, I was telling before, we cannot choose the material, we cannot finalize the aesthetics if we don't have this life size stage, all, all kind of other study incorporated. But that is very similar to architecture. You know. The architects also often dis, uh, uh, decided material they use for their buildings by taking real elements. You see it in the real. They, because I study architecture, you know, really, this is all the things is part of the of the, how this project they are classically related to many of these disciplines. Your projects appear to bring out the worst in the bureaucracies of the spaces that you wish to deal with, <laughs> requiring both patience and persistence. And although your projects themselves are quite different, do you find that there, are a pat there is a pattern in the arguments that you make with these bureaucracies to, to eventually allow this to happen? Okay. I can tell you this is a quite good question. Who, who is in the very essence of this project? No. 
all our works of art have two distinct periods. It's called the software period and the hardware period. <laughs> the software period when the project exists only in drawing and sketches and scale models and the mind of thousand people who try to help us and the mind of thousand people who try to stop us. <laughs> now, that period develop incredible perception of the project. Imagine 4,000 pages written for the work of art do not exist. <laughs> Meaning that you involve so many minds to think about something irrelevant, or beautiful or bad, they thinking about that something, and that created that participatory public. And that is the, the why we not do commissions. Because we like to have that energy, that discovering of identity of the project through the permitting process. I can tell you, for example, the, the getting permission for the rice stack was logistically, we need only permission from speaker of the house, who is like a house, house lord of the building of the parliament of Germany, to give us yes or no. But the prime minister of Germany at the time, uh, Helmut Kohl, was so much against the project, he elev elevated the decision of existing of a work of art and full debate of the parliament and the nation for 70 minutes, and we defeated the prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> the principal speech against the wrapping of the Reichstag was the delivery by the leader of the Conservative Party majority and the parliament of Germany, very famous politician today in Germany. And few months, few years ago, really one year ago, the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung asked that politician called Mr. Schauble, who is the finance minister of Germany, ever in your life you make a mistake? Yes, when I vote against the wrapping of the Reichstag. <laughs> <laughs> Understand? This is something he cannot buy. This is something ha happened to the making of this project. This is why they have this irreplaceable energy who come from the real world. They are not invention, they are real things. And this is why we like to do this project, because nobody can invent that. And it's very risky, it's very expensive, it's very iffy, it's very dramatic, it's not easy, we're screaming, we're fighting. Uh, and of course, this is the real world. And this is why we like to do this project, because they are not make-believe. They are no little intellectual discussion. This is the real things. Sometimes someone might visit a museum and they might look at a famous painting or sculpture maybe for 30 seconds or maybe two minutes and maybe somehow it's hard to access that very famous painting or sculpture. Yeah. Uh, how would you like people to visit or interact with or engage with your works? Uh, but there are no rules how to people interact with our work. You know, the, our works, they're so complex that it's absolutely impossible myself or Jean-Claude to articulate what is the work? We do not know what is the work. The work is so complex. And of course, this is the, the, mag, the uh, pleasure of this project. I'll give you an example uh, with the umbrellas. Umbrellas was like a huge house, roof of the house without walls. And the, uh, and the, the pole and the umbrella, we create a sitting platform, a, a large sitting platform that the people can sit. And the many people in California was coming in the weekends and the sunny days to sit on the umbrellas to have the picnicking. The same thing is happening in Japan. But Japan was something we're never thinking about. The Japanese people removed their shoes and they start to walk on the platform of the blue umbrella because in the houses in Japan, you don't walk with shoes. And of course, all these projects develop so many interpretations. And there's no way that myself or Jean-Claude, we can make prediction how the project is absorbed. It's absolutely absurd. We do not know how the Germans saw the Reichstag. It's impossible. We cannot even pretending to know. This is why all these projects, they have this open dimension. That is not something we can uh, regula regulate. It. And this is the, the enchantment of this project. They have so many levels. And first, our life is too short to start to collecting what the people are thinking about the project. That belongs to the art historian. This is something I even don't like to think about that. The gates in Central Park took 25 years from conception to creation 
and then it exists in reality for two weeks. And how do you and Jean-Claude feel at the end when you see that being taken down? Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. uh, we are relief. You do not understand. You do not understand. We are renting that place. We pay rent of three million dollars of the city of New York. We own that place. You know, all these places we do this project, they became our property, and we were responsible for everything. All our project is copyright and trademark, and we control any not natural use of our project. When we get the permission for the gates, we, Central Park basically became our property. There was a line of television films and Hollywood films to film there. They cannot do that. The same thing is when we get permission for the rice stack, we not only rent the rice stack, we rent about half a kilometer around the rice stack to belong to us. Because right away, the three tenor try to sing on the front of the rice, rap rice stack. Claudio Abato and Maximilian Schell like to bring Berlin Philharmonic to play Fidelio on the front of the Reichstag. <laughs> no way. That became our property. The space can be used like everyday life, but cannot be used for any other uses. This is why is, uh, these 16 days or 14 days, they're so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, draining. We'll be responsible to moving the snow. We're responsible to do everything. And after 16 days, oof, we're relieved. I would like to ask a question about time. We are told Ars longa vita brevis. We call that? And that seems to be a, a standard approach to art that it should last beyond our lives. But your art is deliberately limited in time. And that gives it extra poignancy, the fact that it will go away. And so my question is, what makes you decide on the duration of a particular project? How we decided 14 days. In fact, again, Jean-Claude was a better humor. Jean-Claude, they were always saying, probably it's better to do it shorter, but we can be so, cannot be so egoist. We give two weekends that people think about that they come to see the project. Basically, the project, they realize... But, of course, after 14 days, some projects stay longer, like a 16-day Central Park because of the three weekends. But relatively, this is the way we try to approach and do the project. And it's a matter of simply, we decided this is enough, 14 days, or 16 days, or 18 days, like the umbrellas, 18 days. No, this is the same thing. They are temporary works of art. You know, the important things of this project, you know, they are unique. Nobody can pretending that they see it again. That is the, the pressure moment in your, our life and something we cannot do again, again, again. This is why uh, we always try to return Jean-Claude and myself to the site of the project. The last time she was with me in Australia, 19, 2007, I remember we got to the Rap Coast Cliffs in Australia near Sydney. We saw those big cliffs, the sharks, the South Pacific Ocean. I even dislocated my shoulder wrapping the coastline. It was incredible, so tall, so big for one and a half miles. And Jean-Claude was telling me, probably we were crazy when we tried to do that, but we were very young and we did it. You know, is there this irreplaceable in, in moment that this is the important part? They, they, they sign like that, that way. And of course, the work is also links to that freedom. Actually, this project do not belong to us. <laughs> they happen there that nobody can buy them. No company can charge tickets. Nobody can own them. Because the freedom is enemy of possession. A possession is equal of permanence. When we were in New York at the gates, they gave away little swatches of the material. Yes. Now, in other of your projects, did you give, give away swatches of the material? Yeah, and all the projects. Oh. All the projects. You know, uh, it's not the project because we have so millions of people coming. We always prick it, and it's very expensive, <laughs> a thousand or million swatches. And we donated that in Renningfels, and the islands, and the Paris, and Berlin, 
all this time. This is not something unusual. This is always because the people come there. Of course, they have little brochure with maps. And now, during the exhibition of the project, we have a, a, a keepers of the project. Basically, some of work, non-skilled worker work in the installation of the project. A number of them became keepers, so guardians or monitors of the project, and they take care about the snow, about many things, and they basically talk about the project like in the public space, and one of their duty was to give these free samples, free to everybody, children, and stuff. We saw the gates in the snow, and it was yes. just magical. Yes. You know, Jean-Claude was, I did few sketches, collages with snow, and I remember some dealers, some collector was coming to buy uh, original works, no, preparatory study. And sometimes they say, ah, you did that with the snow, Jean-Claude. But we're not sure when we have snow. We can buy it, but probably never have snow. And I tell you, on these 16 days, we have magical situation. We have a, a sun, we have a rain, we have a snow, we have a, all this wind, and that is what miraculously happened. <laughs> um, all of your projects up to this point have been temporary installations. Yes. Is the Abu Dhabi project... It's permanent, yeah. It's permanent. Like other what, sculpture of the What bar. made you change your philosophy to do a per general. permanent? I was showing before, I have a lot of sculpture existing, and this is one of the sculptures who is permanent, only a little bigger sculpture. <laughs> you told us about Colorado, and you told us about Abu Dhabi. What projects do you have on the board that you haven't told us about? Okay, the... the when... Usually, like, when we never work, I, I forget to say, we never work on one project. This is why sometimes take long time of so some project, not because of the permission. I take some time to explain it. Over the River project started in 92, but this near 18 years, not because of only the permission, because we work on several projects simultaneously. In 1992, when the year or River start, we stopped for three years to finish the rice time. In 2001, when a friend of ours, by chance, we was elected mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg. We put all our resources to finish the gate project. We started much before over the river. This for four years, we were not working over the river. Now, when Jean-Claude passed away, I'm alone, and we were just developing these two projects, and I'm 78 and a half. <laughs> I have no luxuriously to put one project aside and not working on other project. This is why, for the first time in my life, we work on two projects simultaneously. And this is enormous, enormous draining of energy thinking. I have no slightest idea for anything else. I don't even like to think anything else because I am up to here of thinking about these two projects. But if I have a new idea, I can, what Jean-Claude was say, well, we're saying, we're so excited to tell you, and we tell you. Abstract level, how do you perceive, what do you think of your art? not as a work process, not as something tangible. Do you ever think of your installation? What do they represent abstractly? Like the really, idea... In the, really, I don't think this is more different than any artist. I don't think about my art, I'm thinking about my life. Artist is not, art is not profession, you know. You live, art is living. And I don't think about that. I, I live art, that's all. <laughs> thank you. Krista, thank you. We have an exhibition to see.